title of today's message is Driven by Commitment. As you're looking, uh, trying to find Daniel, I just want to say uh, maybe to the new people that I really strongly suggest you to take notes as I give messages Friday or Sunday. Uh, just in different places as well, because there are many advantages to it, taking notes. Uh, if you go to class, just normal school class, and there are a lot of things going on, and when you study, you take notes, and try to memorize and write things that are important. And, uh, you know, my suggestion is we need to be as serious in studying the Word of God, if not more serious in studying God's words. So I really suggest you to take if you take notes in the classrooms, uh, I think it's we should be just as serious in taking notes, getting as much as possible, uh, uh, you know, receiving anything, everything, whatever it comes out of the scripture as possible, so that we can apply it in our lives. There's many practical advantages to it because if you take notes, as you know, I give a lot of points. Even in one point, there are a lot of points. And you lose track. I lose track when I, you know, <laughs> all the time. Uh, but because I have my notes, I can come right back. But if you lose track in the middle of it, it's hard to concentrate. So if you take notes, you can always, you know what's going on. And more senses are involved in learning. And more, more senses are involved in learning, more you can learn. And you can concentrate better for the flow of the messages and things like that. And if you take notes, even if you... Even if you don't look back, okay, you get more out of it. You get more uh, things as you listen. And you can always use it Monday morning when you can't really pray and you have, your mind is blank and nothing to pray about. When you look back to the notes uh, of what you heard through the messages, you can really, it, it will help you to pray better. It will bring back convictions that you had probably Sunday messages, during the Sunday message, and you can meditate and pray with it. That's what I do. Monday and Tuesday, different times of the week, mornings, I look at my messages and try to pray through it, try to apply uh, what I have preached because there's no way I can preach all the things, uh, not, no way I can apply all the things that I preach. And that's what I do like Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings and it really helps me to pray as well. Uh, when I give messages, I assume that people are taking notes. That's why I'm, uh, there's clear outline, there were, uh, you know, clear direction to where we're going and a lot of points. Some might be complaining, too many points, Pastor Min. Well, when you go to buffet, uh, <laughs> you don't complain about having many dishes. You just take what you like. Well, you gotta taste everything first. And then second time you go, you get one or two dishes that are the best ones and you eat it. And just like that, I assume people are taking notes. Like buffet and like Monday morning, Tuesday morning, or Tuesday evening, whenever, whenever you're doing your quiet time, things that convicted you, you pray with it and eat, eat it in the second dish. So, uh, just a little suggestion to the newcomers. But it's not sin to not take notes. It is not any more holy to write, take notes and all these things. It's just a practical suggestion. It's not, it doesn't say in the Bible, take notes. But it does say memorize the scripture and remember and pray through and understand and apply in your life. So I'm just giving you suggestions so that it can be helpful to you. All right. Daniel chapter 3. Exciting story of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fire of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 90 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned such uh, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provin uh, provincial officers to come and declare the image of, uh, he has set up. So the satchels, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other uh, provincial officers, uh, official assembled for dedication of image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what 
you are commanded to do. O oh, peoples, nations, and men of every language, as soon as you hear the sound of horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of horn, flute, zither, lyre, well, all those instruments, all peoples, nations, and men, and every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold and King Nebuchadnezzar set on. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to the King Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, King, live forever! You have issued a decree, O oh, King, that everyone who heard the sound of all those instruments, all kinds of music, uh, fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear these instruments, you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made. Very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times harder than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his armies to tie up Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing robes, uh, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was surged, and, he, and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and fourth looks like a son of God. <laughs> Exciting. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the open, I just feel like preaching, right? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and satraps and prefects and governors and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied uh, the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree, uh, therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Sedrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Let's get to it. Lord, we pray that your power be upon this portion of the scripture as we open it. 
May the fire that helped Sajak Meshan and Abednego to be stronger. Make us strong as well. Help us to go into this fire with them so that we may be strong through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It brings me emotion and tears to think about not all, but some of the past pew sitters of CFC uh, to struggle. It's okay to see them struggle, but rarely having uh, they have relationship with the Lord. Some of them don't even go to church. And it's pretty heartbreaking to see that. Many of them are nevertheless faithful. I mean, when I say things like this, people think, oh, 95% are fallen. No, not like that. Many of them are faithful. They are uh, being working well, going to good grad schools, and serving well in the church. But a lot more than I expect are struggling, struggling with their faith. Perhaps they never had that uh, relationship that we hope to have, that you hope to have. Uh, when the fiery furnace came in their lives, different struggles and difficulties come in their lives, it is uh, difficult for them to stand. Uh, it is difficult for me to see that. So I get to really think about this. Who, who am I? Or who, who are you? Are you a good Christian or are you a bad Christian? Are you a good person or are you a bad person? When I think about it like that, are we more like, is our identity more toward our sin? A lot of times we think like that. We think, oh, people think I'm holy Mary or holy Joe, whatever. And then think, but who I really am is in my struggle and difficulty and in my sin, this is what I do secretly. That's who I really am. So I'm not this holy guy who has relationship with the Lord. But I'm this unholy person in my private. You hear things like who you are when no one's looking. That's who you really are. And we really, really think that's who I am. And we kind of have insecurity because of those things. Well, I think there is some truth to that. Who am I? Because if I am my sin, then... When I go through the difficulties in my life later on, 10 years later, 20 years later, we know that we're going to have difficulties because that's going to prevail. Who I really am is going to prevail. Uh, I thought of it like this. Even though there's some truth to the fact that we are a part of our sin, what we do is part of ourselves. We are, when what we do in our secrets, that's who we really are at times. But I think of it in different perspective like this. We are what we commit ourselves to. I thought of it like that. We are what we commit ourselves to. Because at times we fail in our lives. We go through struggles in our life. Sure, so do I. But more so than others, even though we struggle with insecurities and difficulties of sin, we try our best. Our intention and motive, everything we do, we try to follow our commitment. So in one sense, in a larger sense, as we are not only part sinners, but we are saints of God. That's what we are committed to, to be the saints of God. That's part of our identity. As a believers in Jesus Christ, we carry the cross and follow Christ. And that's what we commit to. So don't be deceived by Satan thinking you are what? You are your sin. That's who, who you are. That's what Satan says. But God says we are our commitment. If we commit ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ, Every day, even though we fail. So that's why we cling to the cross. We are humbled. We are grateful. 
for the daily cleansing that we receive in Jesus Christ. We will fully be sanctified in the Lord when He comes. We are what we commit ourselves to. We are our commitment. So are you a Christian? Have you committed yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? That's who you are. If you are a Christian, that's who you are. Okay? We are in the process of getting who we really are. In our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's going to be revealed. Who we are is revealed. When we face the difficulties. That's what grad guys are facing. I think even as I'm praying, even the ones who are struggling in their faith, it is my prayer. And as long as I'm living, I'm, I have committed myself to pray for them. I have committed myself to pray for you after you graduate, after you go away. That even though they struggle for a while, I think they're going to come out of it. That's my hope. Okay? They're just going on a bungee jumping in their spiritual life. Boing! They're going to come back. Because God will never let them go. That's my hope. That's my prayer. Okay? But that's revealed when we face the fiery furnace like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faces. So we're going to talk about fiery trials, which is going to distinguish who you are. Okay? If you are, if you are truly a Christian, if you have committed yourselves to the Lord, it will reveal who you are. When you go through the fire. Sajak, Meshach, and Abednego is going through the fire and they reveal them what they have committed themselves to. They were remnants. They were Christians. They were the people of God uh, who, who put their lives on the line for the sake of their God. So four lessons on fiery trials in uh, relation in its relationship to God's people. Four lessons on fire trials, and we all gonna go through it in our lives. Difficulties, struggles, persecutions, temptations, whatever you wanna call it. You, whatever you wanna categorize as fiery trials. Okay? Four lessons concerning fiery trials and its relationship with you. Okay? Number one, we will face fiery trials in our lives. We will face the fiery trials in our lives. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream in chapter 2 and he saw the statue made of gold, silver, bronze, and iron and Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that gold. Meaning your kingdom, Babylon, is that gold. And perhaps that got to his head. And he realized, seeing the dream, that his nation, uh, Babylon, Babylon is going to be destroyed by the next kingdom as it's prophesied in chapter 2. So perhaps that's in his mind. So what he's trying to do here, years later, is trying to set the whole statue with gold. He wants to prolong his kingdom, continue his kingdom. And that's what he's trying to do. <laughs> and he set the whole statue with gold. Okay? Symbol of human kingdom again, as we talked about in chapter 2. And what he did was, unless everybody, when the music plays, guitar plays, drum plays, saxophone plays, whatever the, all those instruments mentioned in the chapter, when the music is played, everybody to, is to bow to that statue. Okay? So that he would continuously gather the hearts of people. So that king, uh, nation of Babylon will continue. Okay? That's what he's trying to do. Uh, <clears throat> that's exactly what, what kind of things we will face in our lives. There will be uh, human nations, human philosophy, philosophies that are different from what we believe. There will be spiritual battle. Satan's kingdom, man's kingdom is going to try to conquer our hearts, challenge our philosophy and belief. For Revelation uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 12, it says this. Revelation, just the 
One of the most vivid pictures of Satan, I'll just read it to you. He says, he is filled with fury. Talk about Satan. He is filled with fury. A picture I get is like a dragon with uh, smoke coming out of his nose. <laughs> he is filled with fury. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's not going to be in the tape, so. No. He is filled with fury because he knows that the time is short. Satan knows he's going to be destroyed. He knows the time is short. So he wants to get everybody down with him. It's like an AIDS patient. Not dying with benevolent acts, but trying to spread AIDS as much as possible. He's angry. Daniel chapter 1, he's the angel of light. Daniel chapter 6, he's a uh, uh, roaring lion. In Daniel chapter 3, Right? He comes to give fire to the remnants so that they will bow down to the idols. And that happens in our lives. He wants us to, Satan comes and tempts us and persecutes us in our lives so that we will bow to human philosophy, Satan's philosophy, human kingdom, so that we will avoid the fire rather than go through the fire through the strength of God. How does he bring fire in our lives? How does Satan bring fire in our lives? Through people. A lot of times through people. Through Nebuchadnezzar here. Okay? Not necessarily possess people. We think like the Satan comes through possess people. No. Satan comes through normal people. Satan comes, comes through different kinds of things. Satan came through Nebuchadnezzar. Satan came through those satraps and prefects and all those people in position gossiping to a king, to the king. And notice their words were, you know, they were against you. They didn't say they were against your gods. They said they were against you. Okay. Uh, Satan uses proud hearts. Nebuchadnezzar was so proud that when he was offended, he doesn't, he tries to kill the remnants, kill, kill the people of God. And that's exactly how Satan works, works through people. In this, when you look into this text, this uh, Satan's philosophy or world's philosophy, uh, when you think about it, look at things that are surrounding, things that are surrounding the fire, that seeing that they had to bow because they might be killed. They had to bow to this statue. Now notice king is giving the command to Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and put yourselves in their shoes. King is giving the command. To, to them, he was like his boss. Their boss. It was like their, for some of you, professor or government, authority. Uh, someone who gave benevolent uh, uh, kindness to you. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar is the one who educated them and gave all, gave all the nice place to live and all these things. A lot of times that happened in our lives. Sometimes it, it may be through your parents. Uh, different kinds of philosophy. Different, through people, different kinds of people, someone in authority, someone who's above you may come and it is so incredibly difficult for you to overcome those things when it comes, when the temptations and persecution comes through above. And notice, not only king gives a command, it's through all those music. Zither, lyre, well, all those music, uh, musical instruments as we look into this text. And I think music stirs up emotion. It gives impression. It touches our senses. And a lot of times, same thing. Philosophies of the world comes through emotions. It's trying to stir up our emotions, to, to give impression. Senses stir up our senses. And also music at the time meant it was a cultural thing, cultural norm. And uh, same thing in our lives through our culture that we live in. Uh, temptations and persecutions come so that we will uh, compromise in our lives. Music at the time. Think about the music of our day. It's a cultural thing. And just listening to the music or listening to the words of the music, how can we agree to these things and listen to some of these things that are going on? And through music, with all the music playing, when the music is playing, they were to bow. Okay? And in similar way, those kind of things come in our lives. Also, 
temptation for Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was difficult because everybody was bowing down. Why all those names mentioned when you look at verse 3? Satras, prefects, governors, advisors, treasures, judges, magistrates. Few times these, all these names are mentioned. Not so that Bible will be thicker, but it's trying to point. It was that difficult for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not to bow when all these people were bowing. When everybody's bowing, three heads not bowing. Some of you might be wondering, where's Daniel? Why is he bowing in the corner somewhere? Why isn't he mentioned here? <laughs> no, uh, some some speculate like some there are different speculations. Some speculate because he was in such a high position, uh, maybe he could have hidden or he people couldn't talk about him or something like that. Some say he was on a mission somewhere. I don't know. It's not mentioned, so it's better not to talk about it. But one thing for sure, as we look into the next few chapter, is that. We know for sure, along with these three, he was either absent or definitely he did not bow in this situation. That we know. But all we know is that in this text, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is mentioned. They could have had, they could have done this also. Like, uh, they could have said, ah, oh, you know, I'll just bow, but not in my heart. He's just bowing. He's just acting a little bit. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to really commit myself to this idol. I don't believe it. I believe in God of Israel. I'll just bow and not do it. And a lot of times we do that as well. Mental compromise. I will bow, but not bow in my heart. These kinds of ways Satan will come. These kinds of ways the world will try to make us bow to the cultural norms or, or bow or go into the peer pressure because everybody is bowing. Everybody's doing these things. Everybody's into it, whether through stirring about emotion and impression and senses, through the cultural norm, norm, or through people that are above us, through all kinds of things, Satan tempts us. And it was incredibly difficult for Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not to uh, bow to these things. And they had to go through the fire. Same thing for all the believers in Jesus Christ. We will face fiery trials in our lives. And we can romantically think like this and say, you know, I'll go through the fire for the Lord. But uh, like one thing I get is when we look into verse 19, it says, King was so angry at these three guys that furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Now I thought about that. I go, whatever fiery furnace I went through, it's a lot harder than I thought when I went through it. <laughs> we think, oh, I'll go through it with the Lord. Now keep that idea, nothing wrong with that, but don't be romantic about it. It's going to be difficult when you go through it. It's going to be seven times harder than you think. Basically, how can you measure it was seven times? Was that temperature basically saying it was as hot as it could have been? Same thing in our lives. When we go through the fire, fiery furnace and trials and difficulties in our lives, it's going to be difficult. Okay? Don't have romantic idea. Count the cost right now. Make sure you're committed to the Lord. All of us have different fiery trials and temptations and difficulties in our lives. Okay? But it will help us. Okay? Make sure we are reminded that when we go through difficulties in our lives, there is no resurrection without the cross. We must go through the difficulties in our lives if, our, if we're going to grow through it. Okay? When Jesus says, you must deny yourself, carry the cross and follow Christ, it wasn't just a command. It wasn't only command. But the, uh, it, was, it was there to help us. It was a command to help us. Not so that, not, not, it wasn't just a command so that we can commit and do it. But it was a command to protect us. Because when we deny ourselves and carry the cross and follow Christ, our, it's a protection from the impurities of this world. It's protection from the disease in our soul. 
It's like a surgery. It's, it's his protection. Every command in the scripture is not only something we do as a chore, but it's an absolute necessity. So, protection of God. So, cross carrying lifestyle is not just something we do, nice, and that's a nice thing, but it's absolute necessity for our protection from the impurities of this world. Just like getting rid of the diseases of our soul. It's like a surgery when we carry the cross and follow Christ. So the first point is we will face fiery trials in our lives. Because his deliverance, notice, is not away from the fire, but his deliverance, deliverance here is in the fire. And we must face fiery trials in our lives. Second, uh, thing we must learn about fiery trials in our lives is this. God will be with us through our fiery trials. All of us will go through the fiery trials, but we are not alone in those times. He will be with us. He will go through the fiery trials with us. We will face the fiery trials with the presence of God. Because when we Look into verse uh, 25, and you, I'm sure you detected it as we were reading it. It says, as, as a king, uh, king is looking into the fire, it says, or the people are looking into the fire, says, Look, I see four men walking. Furnace was made in a way you can go through the top, but you can see inside from the side. Okay? It was big furnace, obviously, enough that people can go into it. And when people looked at the side, it was not just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there was another person walking. Fourth man. Hmm? Fourth man. Isn't that illegal? How can the fourth man be there? We just put in three. What is the ID identity of this fourth man? There are much, uh, many theological debates about it. Some people say, oh, it was just angel. Some people speculate it's incarnate Christ. Jesus, before he comes as a human being, he's showing himself as a human being, theophany, uh, visible prison, uh, manifestation of God through as a person. And God does that in different places in the scripture. Aha, uh -huh, that's Jesus. I would say either way, whether it was an incarnate body of Jesus or an angel, even if it's an angel, he's showing his presence through the angel and protection through angels. So whatever it is, that means God is present with them. That's the point. But, I slightly lean toward it being, him being uh, Jesus, because in this book, now when we go to Jesus, Jesus might say, Min, that wasn't me. <laughs> he might say that. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll take a risk. And if you turn a few chapters to the right in chapter 7, and we'll talk about that, uh, when, when he talks about chapter 7, Daniel sees another vision. In chapter 7, verse 13, it says, it says that, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. He's talking about vision of Jesus, vision of Christ. So one like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven. Whatever rise of clouds in the scripture is Jesus. Okay? And here's a son of man. Okay? Son of man. He refers himself to son of man in the gospel. And that's most frequent reference of himself in the gospel, book of gospel. Son of man. Did you know that? One of the most frequent reference to himself. Son of man. Here, one like a son of man was coming with clouds in heaven. In heaven, and he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. So, when I look at that, mm -hmm, I think same book, few chapters before. I think this is a perhaps a manifestation of Jesus Himself. It may not be, but I'm leaning toward that. But whatever, angel or Jesus, it was a presence of God in the fire, the place of unprecedented. Uh, heat is also the place of unprecedented fellowship. The place of unprecedented heat is also the place of unprecedented fellowship 
with a Savior. Uh, I think it's true for us too. When we go through the fire in our lives, we are closest to the Lord. Why? Because, not because He's closer there, but we become more dependent and He's always close to us. And it's just that we now turn our hearts toward Him when the fire is there. When we are not ready for exam, we pray more. When we get sickness, when we go through difficulties in our lives, we depend on Him, we look at Him. So, here, unprecedented heat is also unprecedented fellowship with the Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. God will not leave us alone when we go through the fiery trials of our life. You know, after this life is over, Fire in this world is nothing compared to the judgment fire that's coming. Judgment of God's fiery wrath. Wrath. When we think about hell, we think hell is just a little light or fire that, ooh, it's hot, so I don't want to go to hell. That is just a mere glimpse of the picture of God's wrath. God is angry at you without the glimpse of love in hell. That's what hell is. Heaven is, God is loving you without a glimpse of His wrath. That's what heaven is. Judgment of God's fiery wrath is coming. Hey. Fiery wrath of God will not harm the remnants. Believers in Jesus Christ. Why? Because of Emmanuel, God with us. We are under the shadow of the Most High. If we hide under the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, He takes my wrath. When you think about Moses and burning bush, he, uh, he goes to uh, meet the Lord and there's burning bush. Sunday school story, fire. Notice that fire does not consume. Aha, that's how God is toward his remnants. That's what he's showing to Moses. He's still holy God, but his holiness is not going to burn us because Christ is burned with the wrath of God on the cross. That's why Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3, says this. To all the remnants of God, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. These are the promises that we can hold on to in the midst of trials. And it says, You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Listen. When you walk through the fire, you will not be harmed. You will not be burned. The flame will not set you ablaze. I mean, God, talking about being faithful, literally <laughs> uh, fulfilling His promise. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not set you ablaze. That's right. Fiery furnace we might go through, but we will not be burned because God is with us. Now, when we think about things like that, you, you must have a correct theology of God when you go through the fire. Now, it's just amazing what these Cedric, Meshach, and Abednego would Limited revelation that he received, that they received in Old Testament. They received lesser revelation than us because we have more revelation through the scripture and through Jesus Christ. But less, with less revelation, what incredible theology they had. As we look into Daniel 3, verse 17. Now, this is the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, you do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We do not need to defend ourselves. Because Nebuchadnezzar said in verse 15, If you go into the fire, what God will able to rescue you from my hand? Think your little hand that he has, comparing himself to God of Israel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saw a bigger hand. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, God we serve is able to save us from it. So one thing that we have to realize, one fact they had in their minds is God is powerful. God is powerful to save from any hands, any human king, anything. He's more powerful because he's a king of kings, lord of lords. 
He's a powerful, awesome, incredible, biggest hand, God. But not only that, go on. Not only did, did they think about him as a God who's powerful, but also God who's good. Even if you're powerful, if you're not good, you're not going to protect me. But not only you're powerful, you're able, but you're also good that you will protect me. Hey? hey? You're a good God. Look at this. Verse 17, it says, God we, uh, we serve is able to serve, uh, save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But, he says, even if he does not. This is, even if faith, even if faith. What in the world does that mean? Even if it does not mean it, he will save us. But even if he doesn't, I trust him. Okay? I trust his goodness. Even though I might die, I trust in his goodness. He's not an evil God who will slay me, who will, or ev evil God who will lead me uh, there. But even if he does not, even if I die, he's still good God. He's doing something best for me. He's still doing good for me. It is, if I die, it's because God lets me die. It's because I trust Him that He's such a good God that for me to die is better than for me to live. Okay? I trust God enough that it's better for me to die than for me to live. That's the God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted. Correct theology. God is present, sure. God is powerful, sure. But they had even if faith because they had the correct theology of God. So the point is, do you trust Him? When things go, little difficulties come in your life, you get, oh, maybe He's not with me. Maybe He's not powerful enough. Maybe He's not really good. I mean, how can you say to people who had you know, I talk to all kinds of people. People who were raped. People whose parents died in car accidents. People, uh, difficulties, death. How can you say to these people that God is good? I, I, I don't know. All I know is I trust Him. I cannot prove to them with my words. But I have to say it with scripture. God is good. Because it was better for that to happen than not. And we can't see it from here. But one of these days we will. God is good. Do you trust him? Do you have faith of even if? Then you can survive through anything in this world. You know his presence, his powerful, and even if you die, hmm, hmm, even if you die, it's better for you to die than to live. That's why. Unconditional faith. Do you have even if faith or do you have only if faith? Think about that. Do you have even if faith or do you have only if faith? Only if this happens, I'll trust Him. If you don't trust Him in any occasion, you have only if faith. It's conditional. When I say unconditional, it's no matter what happens, I'll trust in you. In Habakkuk, right? I'll just read this. Basically, Habakkuk, the prophet, knows the wrath of God is coming for the Israelites for they worshipped the idol, they did not obey God, and they knew that they're going to be stepped on. And country is going to come, they're going to devour them. His, his family is going to die, his people are going to die. So Habakkuk says this, knowing all this incredible persecution will come because of sins of Israelites. And they're going to go under exile. He prays like this. In verse 2. That's why in chapter 3 verse 2 of Habakkuk. I'll just read it to you. Lord, I have heard your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O oh Lord, renew them in our day. 
Now they're going to go, go through persecutions. Horses are going to come and kill the people. And people are going to be killed. My family is going to be killed. My brothers and sisters are going to be killed. He says, but renew them in our day. In our times, make them known. But in wrath, remember mercy. And then he prays later. Uh, he prays later in 17 of chapter 3. Though the fig trees does not bud. Mm -hmm. Even if. And there are no grapes and vines. Nothing to eat. Even if. Though the olive crops fails. Even if. The fields produce no food. Even if. Though there are no sheep in the pen. And no cattle in the stalls. Even if. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, even if I trust Him. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like a feet of a deer. And He enables me to go on the heights. Job says the same thing. Job thirteen fifteen. Though you slay me, <laughs> meaning God is the active agent, you kill me. Though you slay me, yet I will. Do you have that kind of even if faith? Then his presence in your life, no matter what happens in your life, is comforting factor. I cannot prove to you. You have to come to your own faith with it. Third, third lesson, as we go through the fiery trials in our lives, is that <laughs> we will go through the fiery trials and He's with us. And when we go through it with Him, we will be purified through the fiery trials. We will be purified. Let me say one thing. Fiery trials will distinguish true believers from the false ones. Are you going to stand? Are you actually going to go through it or go around it? Because you go through it because you want to obey the Lord. And when you go through the difficulties, you know who's going to remain as believers in Jesus Christ. If you are a tree that is planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, uh, who's, who bears fruit in season and out of season, that you remain standing in the midst of stone because your root is deeply rooted in the streams of water. God, His presence. Are you the one that bows when the music plays? Or are you the one that's standing? Even if. The music plays. Only the real ones will stand through the fiery trials of the world. There are a lot fewer believers than we think as we look into the scripture. That's what Jesus says. <laughs> there are a lot fewer than we think. And I wake up and sweat at night sometimes thinking, how many of you are true believers? How many of you will be there with me in heaven? In the fire, God is not just someone to uh, go to when you have problems. In the fire, God is not just someone you discuss like you discuss in a small group. Because in the fire, God is someone you obey as only Lord. And only in your obedience, He protects you. Is He the treasure that you would give all your life? All your life accomplishments. Isn't that what Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? All the things they accomplished, they were able to throw it away. Naked in their faith, they go through fire. Risking their lives. Is he the treasure that you would give all of your possession and life, accomplishment to purchase? Is he that treasure that you want to purchase? When the fire comes, we'll know who are the remnants. Here in this chapter, only three. Daniel in the corner, somewhere four. 
many, many Israelites before. And if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, when the fire comes, you'll be purified and you receive freedom. Because, verse 25, Look, I see four men walking around the fire. Remember, they were bound before they went to the fire, but when they went into the fire, they were unbound, unharmed, unbound. Hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. just, I think God put it in there. Because <laughs> when we go through the fire, we become free. From our sinful, proud, selfish, self-dependent souls. Are freed from the lust of this world. When you go into fire, you're not going to care about your car. You're not going to care about what clothes you wear. Am I a Christian? Do I love God? You are free from the lust of the world to love the Lord. With all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And you become purified, holy, humble, selfless, God-dependent saints through the fire. We are purified to love God. That pearl. Pearl is made, you know, as oyster embraces with pain, suffering. Pearl is made. Uh, you know, these... Sajak Meshach and the man who gave up everything, accomplishment in their life to get that pearl. God, and in fact, that process of gaining that pearl, God uses to make us his pearl. So that he can show himself what he is like through us. He becomes our pearl and he, in that process, is making us his. That's why he's my choice because I was his. <laughs> when you be you're believers, if you're believers in Jesus Christ, <sighs> Satan extinguishes flaming arrows as well. Okay? You will go through difficulties in your lives, and Satan will attack you if you're a true believer. But let me say this. Because Satan tries to destroy God's plan by destroying God's people. Okay? So if you're God's people, you receive attacks of Satan. Okay? Isn't it strange that even like you look at book of De uh, Esther, when Haman, proud heart, is angry at one Jew, he tries to kill all the Israelites because it's a spiritual battle. Satan is using the proud heart to extinguish all the believers, Israelites. Man will continue to invent new, different, uh, creative furnaces to destroy remnants. But God will use them to preserve, purify them, to keep His truth alive in this world. Oh, incredible. Are you listening? <laughs> if you're listening, you'll be amazed with me. <laughs> Satan tries to distinguish the remnants of God. But let me say this. You will never, ever see the end of faithful remnants. Never, ever, ever, ever see the end of faithful remnants. Their number might be small. Four or seven thousand in Elijah's days. We think there are millions of people, millions of Christians in this world. I don't think so. As we look into the scripture. In Daniel's, in book of Daniel's 3 or 4. Okay. Numbers might be few. But God's remnants will survive. When you look into book of Luke chapter 1. Now, there are 400 years of silence of God's prophets, intertestament times, and there was no prophecy in between. Is there going to be any remnants there? Is there going to be any remnants? There's this old man called Simeon, <laughs> who's waiting all of life for the Messiah to come, a remnant. And when he sees Jesus in his hand, now that I've held him in my hand, 
my life can come to an end. Today is a good day to die. <laughs> That's what Simeon saying. Old lady in the temple, 84 years old or 84 years she's been widow, but living in the temple, praying and fasting. There was a remnant. Why? Because end of remnant will never come. Church of Jesus Christ will march on. Gates of hell will not prevail. My question to you is, are you a remnant? Are you a true believer in Jesus Christ? <sighs> My prayer is just two. One is, Lord, I want to be one of them. And my second prayer is, I want all of you to be with me. Carry on the redemptive plan of God. Only way to check whether you are a true Christian or not now is your faithfulness now. Now. Don't talk about how you were in the youth group. If you're not faithful now, you better seriously check whether you're a believer or not. Don't talk about you are my days. 20 years later. 20 years later, if you're not faithful now, you better doubt your salvation. 20th century is the only century that Christians were so easily giving out the assurance of salvation. Not just when you raise hands in a revival meeting, you are saved. Does it show it? Is the Spirit of God alive in you now? How's your life? Is Jesus your pearl? Are you crazy about Jesus? That's my concern for you. Fiery trials will show. Fourth, teaching concerning the fiery trial is that God is glorified through the remnants who goes through the fiery trials. God is glorified the most through the trials. God is glorified. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when the remnants went through the fire, Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 28, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In some sense, if Daniel was in here, we would have said, man, it was because of Daniel that these three guys were okay. It was like a, when uh, Jordan retired for a while, they realized how Scottie Pippen and Bulls were. They were pretty good. Even without him, they were almost in the same. Cause just one game away from being in the finals. It's like that. When Daniel is not there, we see how Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were strong in their faith. A lot of times when you're related to different kinds of people, it's good to follow that and that's good. You need that in your life. You need friends. But when you're alone, when you go through difficulties, when you go home after the break and your small group is not checking you with the telephone, kind of check, you can, you can kind of see what you are made of. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego passed the test without Daniel. Okay? But if you go through the fire, God will be glorified. Let me just say two practical principles for preparation. Pastor, <laughs> tell me, Lord. I mean, tell me, Pastor, <laughs> not Lord. Okay, you can come. Tell me, Pastor, how can I prepare myself? Number one is pay attention to small matters. Pay attention to small matters. Small matters. Remember, reason why they were able to go through the fire, yes to the fire, is because in chapter 1 they say no to the food. Small matter. Hmm? That's the 
principle they live by in every small matter up to now. Pay close attention to your small matter. What you say yes to, what you say no to. It all illustrates how faithful, loyal behavior sustained in a series of quiet uh, decisions and less important matters can come to glorious fruition in a spectacularly uh, courageous witness to God in the hour of more severe and open trials. How are you in the small matters of your life? Do you compromise? Oliver Cromwell, as you know, the famous general, when he went out in the first battle, a lot of people noticed he looked so, so experienced. He did so well even in the first battle. Secret was this, that in his preparation for the battle, in all of his life, he overcame the battles within him. And he was able to say no to his flesh and commitment to the Lord. That he was able to overcome a lot of battles in his life. Let me say this. Prepare later battles. Now as you say no to the small matters of your life. Say no to meat. Then you can say yes to the fire in your life. Uh, second suggestion is this. Now when you get to the fire, just obey. Whatever it is, just obey. As you read the scripture, get these principles in your minds and just do the right thing. Obey. Because when you look into this text, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not really do spectacular things. Yeah, going into the fire, yeah, that's a spectacular thing, I guess. But when you look, in, look into it in a in a, we look into the principle, they just simply obeyed and did not bow. They did not volunteer to go into fight. They just didn't bow. First and second command. No other God. Okay? They did the right thing. Why? Because of their even if obedience. Holy stubbornness. When everybody bowed, they stood. Holy conspicuity. They were conspicuous, and sometimes we don't want to do that. But when we, when we obey God, sometimes we are conspicuous. Not intentionally, but we will show. If every, even if everybody does it, you do not want to disobey God, so you obey. Unintentional, holy conspicuity. That's good. world wants us to blend in nicely. World wants our knees to be bent, but we will not. We will stand. Our duty is to do, to do the right thing, no matter consequence. What consequences? If we do the right thing, just obey. Simple obedience in our lives, then consequences is with God. He will use our obedience. He will use our lives so that others can uh, see God through us, so that their knees will be bowed to worship the Lord. When we resolve to do what is right in difficulty, it keeps the testimony of God alive so that they may see uh, God through us. Hey. It may cost it. It might, be, it might be costly in our lives. Very few are willing to pay that price of that kind of obedience. I don't know what kinds of people are your heroes. My, my heroes are just, uh, my heroes are people who just simply obey continuously, consistently. People who've been, who's been Christians for 10, 20 years. And before, I used to respect people who do, like, I respect pastors because I'm a pastor, I guess. And then I used to respect people who do ministry so well. I used to respect those people. Now I respect someone who just stays there. Someone who just keeps doing ministry for 10, 20 years because I'm not sure if I can go through it. I'm not sure if I can continue to do it for 10, 20 years. It's hard. I just respect people who are just simply obeying God and just staying there. Hey, just keep on taking, keep on going. Because it takes such sacrifice. They are my heroes. Price of heroism. We have heroes. 
But and we all want to be heroes, but we don't want to sacrifice ourselves. You know, when I talk to your parents, your parents will probably say, "Oh, let us let us be like Hudson Taylor." And if all of you will volunteer and say, "Okay, I want to be like Hudson Taylor." A lot of your parents will say, no, no, no. <laughs> you can't go on a mission trip. <laughs> you can go to mission field. Price of heroism. Okay? True heroes are rarely admired when they're doing their heroic work. Usually they're regarded as fools, fanatics, unbalanced people who have taken their work far too seriously. This is heroism. The willingness to be true to the principles, no matter what the cause may be. You know what the heroes are? Heroes are people driven by commitment. People who are driven by commitment. Uh, in 1837, three young Methodist ministers, James Calvert, John Hunt, Thomas Jagger and their wives set out from England for the Fiji Islands. Uh, it was a difficult assignment because some people who are living there were still cannibals. They were man-eating people. So the captain of the ship that took the three English couples from England tried to persuade them and change their mind from going to the islands. The cannibals there. Okay. And he told uh, Calvert, you will lose your lives and the lives of those with you if you go among such savages. Calvert replied, we died before we came here. John Wesley said, give me a hundred men who love God with all their hearts and fear nothing but sin, I will move the world. And I agree. Let's pray. As I'm preaching the Word of God, some people will complain for a sermon being longer than an hour. While I'm talking about dangers and bombs and threats that will, will come in your life, you're living in a dream world. You think this life is a walk in the rose garden. <sighs> Let me say this. There will be valleys of shadow of death in your life. And I don't know how many of you will survive through the fire. It will come. It will come. But He will be with you who believe and trust in Him. For those people who will have even if faith, if you do, you'll be purified. And you'll be used by God to glorify Himself. Hmm? I ask you to be ready. In the small matters of your life, learn how to say no. Learn how to say yes to the Lord. So that when you come to it, 
you'll have that faith, even if I will go through the fire. For I trust in your promise, O oh Lord, that as I walk through the fire, you'll be with me. I will not be burned. Worst thing that can happen to me is I die and go to your presence. Then the worst thing that will happen to me is the best thing that will happen to me. We are in no lose situation. We go through little fires and difficulties in this life. Oh, but the glorious future is coming. Okay? The rest of the eternity will live with him. When we go through the cross, we receive the power of resurrection. Let's pray to the Lord. Say to the Lord, Lord, help me. Help me to be driven by commitment. Help me to commit myself to you. No matter what happens in this life, may I not be driven by my sin. May I not be driven by my flesh. But may I be driven by my commitment. May that be me. Help me to become a Christian. Even if obedience. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your presence in our lives, even though we may be walking through the valleys of shadow of death, that you are present in our lives. And all we have to do is heed to your voice, our shepherd, and you will protect us and guide us. Be with this congregation as they walk through the fire, fiery trials in their lives. Help them to overcome with even if faith and even if obedience help us to be the people driven by commitment In jesus name we pray amen shall we rise god of daniel god of you generation after generation he's been faithful to the remnants who will have even if obedience in their lives who are driven by commitment I sing about that you have been a shelter Lord you have been a shelter Lord every generation every generation sanctuary from the storm Every generation, every generation, Lord. You have been a shelter, Lord. You have been a shelter, Lord. To every generation, to every generation. 
sanctuary from the storm to every generation to every generation Lord Lord the mountains fall Though the mountains fall Though the earth should shake Though the sea should grow with all the heartache Though the heart should pound Though our throats be dry We will lift your name on high You have been a shelter, Lord To every generation To every generation The sanctuary from the storm to every generation, to every generation, Lord. Even if, though the mountains fall, though the earth should shake, though the sea should flow with all the heartache, though our hearts should Let's be dry. We will lift your name on high. You have been a shelter, Lord, to every generation, to every generation, a sanctuary from the storm. To every generation, to every generation, through the fire, though the mountains fall, though the earth should shake, though the sea should grow with all the heartache, though our hearts should pound. Though our thoughts be dry, we will lift your name on high. You have been a shelter, Lord, to every generation, to every generation, sanctuary from the storm. Pray that He will continue to purify us so that we will love Him and Him alone in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus, you're the precious pearl. There's no other in all the world so beautiful. Who is like you? Jesus, you're the cornerstone. Your foundation will stand alone, no other love can satisfy. You are my portion, you are my satisfaction, nothing else. And take the place of loving you. You're my inheritance. Not as a world can give. Your love is 
is life, a buried treasure, precious pearl beyond all measure, beautiful, so valuable, Jesus, you're the precious pearl. There's no other in all the world so beautiful. Who is like you? Jesus, you're the cornerstone. Your foundation will stand alone. No other love. Satisfied. You are my portion. You are my satisfaction. Nothing else can take the place of love in you. You're my not as a word can give Your love is like a buried treasure Precious pearl beyond all measure So beautiful So that you are my portion You are my portion, you are my satisfaction, nothing else can take the place of love in you. You're my inheritance, not as a world can give you love. Precious pearl beyond all measure, beautiful, so valuable. Let's pray. Pray just for a couple more minutes. Praying to the Lord that you will remain faithful till He returns or till you die. We'll continue to pray for one another. That you'll be faithful 10 years later. That 20 years later. That you'll prove your salvation uh, through your life. Okay? Let's pray for ourselves and pray for one another. That we remain standing even if everyone bows. Through the fire, through the earthquake, through the storm. That we remain faithful as he is to us. Pray to the Lord for just for a couple minutes. Father, we thank you and praise you for your grace. Thank you and praise you for your mercy that you are with us, God with us, God of Emmanuel, that you take all the fire and wrath away from us so that we will not be burned through it. 
but you help give us strength to go through it. Help us to prepare ourselves as we give, as we pay attention to little matters in our lives, and live an uncompromising obedience presently, so that in the future, that we will be able to say no to the temptations and persecutions of this world and say yes to you. And we pray that you will keep each and every one of these guys faithful till you return. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, awesome love of our God, unending fellowship and koinonia of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.